Hello, bonjour. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. I'm so, so honored to be here. Um, the very first time I came to MicroConf was three years ago. Um, and this is kind of going to be a bit of a masterclass in what not to do or what to do, uh, <laughs> what happens if you don't follow the advice of MicroConf. So I really wish I'd been exposed to this community a lot earlier than I was. Um, so this is going to be a very honest behind the scenes of what has happened since we launched and our journey to sustainability. So this is my partner, Ben. Ben and I run a company called Okie Doki. We also have a software called Doki at doki.io where we help people launch online courses, mentorship programs, coaching programs, masterminds, productized services. This is Mochi, she's head of customer happiness. <laughs> she also has an Instagram account, by the way, Mochi Chan Chiba. So back in 20, 2016, Ben and I asked ourselves, why are we living in the most expensive city in Canada while trying to bootstrap our SaaS? And so we did what any bootstrapping entrepreneurs would do that can't afford real estate in Vancouver, and we bought a house in the woods in a town that we'd never been before. So we bought this half-acre property in the Sunshine Coast of Canada. And this is where things kind of slowed down, because up until this point, we'd been working a lot on our SaaS. Now that we had all this land and all this new responsibility while also working on our SaaS, I had no idea how to maintain our land, our gardens. I had to learn how to chop wood, had to learn how to drive a standard. <laughs> it was a bit of an adventure. A friend of mine told me, you should check out permaculture. Um, I had no idea what permaculture was. I'm curious how many people here know or have heard of permaculture. A couple hands, it's pretty cool. So my friend said, you gotta sign up for these classes. Had no idea what I was getting into. And conveniently, there was also a program launching, I think a few months after we'd moved in. This was the first email that I got from the program. And it said, become a more conscious designer of your life, landscape, relationships, and work while learning how to save time, energy, and money. That sounds pretty compelling. And because there was this amazing picture of cats hanging out in a field, I, had, I just had a feeling this was gonna be good. So permaculture, if you don't know, it's a set of techniques and principles for designing sustainable human settlements. What does that mean? So permaculture has us look at what do you wanna get out of your land? What is your goal and what do you wanna get out of it? Do you just wanna grow a few herbs, vegetables for your garden? Do you wanna be totally self-sustaining? Or do you just want a therapeutic oasis of calm? And obviously there's no right answer, but everything starts with knowing what do you actually want to get out of your land. And the deeper I dove into permaculture, I started to realize how many parallels there were with software. What is your goal and what do you want to get out of your SaaS? I know Justin talked about this a little bit yesterday. Is it just a creative challenge for you? Is it a side hustle? Are you trying to replace your full-time income? Do you want to build it to sell? And again, there's no right answer to this, but I wish that we had done the work to ask ourselves these questions before we started building. So what would your SaaS look like if you designed it on purpose? Us, we kind of stumbled into it, took on a life of its own, never really stopped to ask ourselves, what would it require to grow? So I'm gonna take you through the process, how we launched our idea, got it to a point that it's sustainable, some of the things we got wrong and right along the way, what permaculture can teach us about software, and what it means for you, so some concrete takeaways. These are the permaculture principles. Don't worry, I won't go into detail about every single one of these. Um, I'm gonna focus on a few that I think are the most relevant and give you some example takeaways from our own experience and what we've learned. In 2014, Ben and I teamed up to form Okie Doki. I was handling mostly web design and strategy. Ben was the technical co-founder handling development projects. So we teamed up under one roof, but we were still operating like two separate companies. Our own clients, our own processes, everything was completely separate. But most of my clients at the time were people who had online courses, membership programs, productized services, and these were also the people who had money to pay for web design services. It was taking a lot of time to do this custom integration, linking up PayPal, MailChimp, a lot of moving parts, obviously, if any of you have worked with online courses and memberships. 
So I said, this is taking a really long time. Like, surely there's got to be an easier way to do this. I was using a whole bunch of WordPress plugins to make this happen. And Ben said, we should build our own. And so we started tinkering and did the first commit in mid-2014. Notice that there's no customer research happening around this time. Just going to throw that out there. <laughs> around the same time, I had an idea to develop a program of my own. And I'd been working in the web design community for a very long time. I was in conversation with web designers constantly. I knew this market so well. And I created a program called Digital Strategy School that was a four-month mentorship program that helped web designers transition into a role of digital strategist. I did an alpha, which is basically pre-selling, like Adam mentioned yesterday. And pre-selling it, um, and just to just a bit of a sidebar, because I know Justin talked about validating your idea by getting 500 people on a list. I didn't have a list <laughs> when I sold this, um, and it brought in $10,000. I did it as a pay what you can. It was kind of an interesting experiment, but once it brought in $10,000, I thought, okay, there's something here. I know this market. I love working with these people. There's, there's an opportunity here. I launched a beta, and the beta brought in $50,000. I don't even think I had 300 people on my list at the time that I did this. So if you ever want to chat after about um, how to do a lot with a really small audience, that's certainly something that we've been, been really good at. So then we go all in and we'll think, well, Ben will work full time on our app. Now we've got money, we've got some funding to do this. Let's have Ben work full time on our application. And this is really where we missed out on the first and most important rule of permaculture, which is to observe and interact. And this is really about customer research, observing the market, paying attention to the patterns before you start building anything. So in permaculture, the example is you're paying attention to what's happening with the sun, with the shade, you know, like you're getting all of the data about your land. What's fertile? Um, how moist is the soil? You're not gonna go planting some incredible permaculture oasis before you know what you're working with. What are the temperatures like? Do you have predators on your land? We didn't really do much of this observation. It didn't take very long <laughs> to learn that anything that isn't covered by a fence, by an enclosure, is basically an all-you-can-eat buffet for the deer. Painful learning. All of the alpine strawberries gone. So we had to adapt. But we didn't know this until we observed. So in permaculture, you're spending a year up to a year often observing your land before you make any major decisions. Why did we think software was going to be any different? So on the software side, you've got things like founder skills. Like, what do we have to work with? Let's actually analyze. Do we have access to this market? We didn't do any customer interviews. You know, we had a handful of people that we knew that had this problem, but we weren't really digging deep to make sure we really, really understood the landscape before we went all in. We also didn't really do the work to see what would our lives look like if this SaaS does succeed? How much of our time and our energy is this going to require? Didn't really do this work. Definitely did not do enough customer research. I know you guys are probably hearing that over and over again. It might be boring, but really, I wish this is something that I had really understood um, before we started building our product. So I was doing all this customer research and market research on the one side of our business. Digital Strategy School was going really well. We're like funneling all that money into our SaaS. It was awesome. And on the Doki side, we had already committed to the idea. We were basically solving a problem for five people that we knew. You know, we'd only had a few key conversations and it can take three or five and you're like, yes, I know that we've got that idea. We're, we're going all in. I feel like we could have learned so much even from 20 interviews, 100 interviews. So, Permaculture principle, observe and interact. Make sure you really, really, truly, deeply understand the landscape before you touch a line of code. That means more customer interviews, more why questions, so you understand the sort of underlying context of what's happening. Um, and gathering qualitative and quantitative data as well. Hearing people's stories. Tell me about a time when. So at this point, I'm full-time on Digital Strategy School, and Digital Strategy School is mostly replacing my client income. Awesome. Meanwhile, Ben is working full-time on the app, and we've just gone all in before we've hit a dime. So we kind of skipped 
you know, it's funny, uh, Rob Walling and I, when we were talking about the, the title for this talk, we were thinking, oh, maybe, you know, how we funded our SaaS with a six-figure course, which in a way feels really misleading because the problem is we didn't put any pressure on our SaaS to bring in revenue from the beginning. So because it, we sort of treated it like playtime, oh, we've got enough revenue coming in over here, we don't need to get paid customers yet, let's just play for a year, which is insane. Um, <laughs> so we kind of skipped through some of these permaculture principles. Use small and slow solutions. And when I say slow, I don't mean not getting to market quickly, I mean being slow to make permanent decisions. So some of the decisions we made, we locked in our infrastructure so early on, we sort of over-engineered it, that by the time we'd had those customer conversations, it was a lot harder to make those changes. I'm not gonna go and build this magical oasis overnight. I don't know anything about gardening, right? I would love for my backyard to look like this, to transform it from a lawn into this tropical oasis. That would be really amazing. But there's still lots of information and data I don't have about how our yard works. And so you gotta start small and slow. And the smallest thing I can do right now is build a raised garden bed. Just start with the smallest little piece. Um, be slow to make permanent decisions. I'm gonna be doing hand watering instead of installing some crazy irrigation system that's likely gonna change in a year or two once I know more about the land. So this was a brand new endeavor with a brand new technology that Ben had never used. It was like, it'd be cool to, to learn a new tech. Uh, really complex functionality, multiple layers of user permissions because we're selling to other people who are selling to other people, like there's multiple levels. And so I don't think we even understood the full scope of what we were building, which was probably, in some ways was a good idea. Um, it would have been insanity. So a sort of new to us market. I'd worked with people on the web design side, but I wasn't talking to course creators directly. I wasn't talking to instructional designers. I didn't have a really good sense of what were the challenges that course creators were facing. So we kind of committed before we really had any revenue. Starting small might have just been interviewing 20 people. Like, what is the smallest step that we could take? If we had asked ourselves, what challenges are course creators creating? Some of the solutions it may not have even been a software, because there were ways to do this before with WordPress plugins. Might have designed some prototypes instead of over-engineering this crazy, you know, built-to-scale thing before we had those customers. Landing page with signups, right? You've had, heard people talk about this already. Writing some blog posts and see what resonates. We weren't really the people in that space. People knew me as a web designer and a digital strategist, and I had a program. Well, suddenly, we have this new endeavor, and we don't have the audience to, um, to go along with it. I might have even been doing just some simple consultations with people. We did not start small. We went right to big. We did our first demo once the product was already built. Please don't do this. I really, really wish that we had brought in someone from the very beginning in its rough and ready state. I mean, even, even our friends, we would have benefited from having our friends who were course creators to, to play with it and just to see how they were using it. Product demos are so, so humbling. And even just watching someone use your tool, logging in, don't say anything, watch somebody use your tool, things that you think are intuitive are not <laughs> intuitive. You are not your audience. So please, please don't wait to show your demo. It doesn't matter if you're embarrassed, you're gonna have to get more comfortable doing this kind of work. And we also built it in secret. We weren't really telling our friends about it, we weren't really public about it, and I think because we had spent so much effort and time building it behind the scenes, we were afraid to fail. So we're like, well, if we don't like, talk about it, we'll just kind of work on it behind the scenes, you know, it'll be fine. You have to tell people what you're working on. You have to be in conversation constantly. We had friends say this. Oh, sorry, I didn't even know you guys had a thing I, I already signed up for. We won't name our competitors. <laughs> it's heartbreaking it was, and kind of ridiculous because we had an audience of people that we had access to from other parts of our business, but we weren't really in touch with people. Your friends should not be the last to know what you're working on. <laughs> A reality check was that we were also letting our competitors lead our innovation. And that meant that we sort of felt like if a competitor offered a feature, we needed to catch up and also offer that feature. We were listening to them more so than watching how our customers were using the platform. 
We really wish we had done that awkward learning on a smaller product. So use small and slow solutions. Embrace small, imperfect progress, and your customers really, really do have the most to teach you. I promise you, you cannot go wrong. You cannot do too much customer research. So share those early concepts. Do not wait till it's polished to show it. Do things right the first time, and be honest about your limitations. 2016, I attended MicroConf for the first time. How many first-timers? I feel like mostly first-timers, amazing. Um, how many people went in 2016? Cool. Obviously, the conference totally blew my mind. I was more in the online marketing, maybe info product space, but I didn't know anything about software. And I was kind of bummed that Ben didn't come with me. I think he was at uh, EmberConf at the time. So I'm going to MicroConf and I'm having my mind blown um, and just realizing how little I knew about software. I didn't know about churn, MRR, all these terms, I felt like such a noob. It was kind of amazing, like I was, it was really exciting. Um, but it was also the beginning of realizing yeah, just how little, how little I knew and how much work we had to do to catch up. The interesting thing too is at this point, at the beginning of 2016, we'd managed to get to 1,000 MRR from mostly our immediate network. But we didn't know how to move beyond the people that we already knew. So this next principle is designing from patterns to details. I think it's really easy to focus on the small details, the features, we get really zoomed in. And we weren't really noticing the underlying patterns that were happening. In the permaculture side of things, I love this quote, perverse planning is everywhere obvious. Houses face not the sun, but rather the road. Lawns replace gardens. Trees are planted to be pruned and, and tended. Lawns are the most inefficient things that we can possibly do that require so much work of us. And so permaculture is intended to kind of work with the natural patterns of nature and not create more work. We had really focused in on the details. What technical stack do we use? You know, building specific features, creating a course, selling a course, delivering a course. These were kind of the things we were so focused on. This is what people want to do and this is how we think it's going to be. We weren't really noticing some of these really interesting underlying patterns that started to surface once we had people using the product and once we were just in conversation with people. People just wanted a way to diversify their offers. How do I turn my one-on-one -on -one into training? How do I bundle different offers together? Um, a lot of our customers are people who have a services-based business that want to integrate some kind of online course. There's also course fatigue. People being tired of, of, oh, you need an online course, everyone and their grandma has an online course. Those are some interesting objections to hear our customers say. Things like training versus course versus program, masterminds. There's different language that people are using and what's going to resonate with the people that make the most sense for us. Imposter complex procrastination. So we would notice people sign up for the platform and then request uh, an extension of their trial for like another month, another month, another month. And when we reached out to them, they're like, oh man, I just, I didn't realize how long it was going to take me to build an online course. They were kind of expecting that the platform would kind of magically help them create that course. So we were full, so focused on the details of execution that we were kind of missing out on these larger patterns. Our ideal customers were entrepreneurs who had high-touch coaching programs. Again, this is not something we necessarily knew in the beginning, but the more people that were attracted to our platform tended to be these people. So again, the customers were extending their trial. Courses were taking them way longer than they expected. And this was a really interesting piece of data. So the time to value, to get the value out of our platform, was a lot longer than we expected. How we close that gap? A really great question to ask yourself when you're trying to zoom out and make sure you're not getting too into the details. Um, this also relates to Patrick's question of what should we build, is to say, how might we? So we, we might have asked these questions. How might we improve the experience of online teaching? How might we make it easier to distribute training? These are some of the things that we're really trying to do at the end of the day, instead of how might we build a course platform? How do we help people sell their courses? This one's a lot more prescriptive. So design generally before specifically and make sure that you understand the underlying patterns that are happening. What's the emotional context that's happening around the process of creating a course? Zoom out, make sure you understand the problem from all angles and all people who are involved in that process as well. Why were we not talking to instructional designers? 
Why were we not looking at it from different angles? Teachers that teach in, in classrooms. 2016, 2017, so we're getting people asking us, well, you're the course people. Can you help me launch my course? I was like, oh crap, like I'm, I'm running digital strategy school and Ben's building this platform, so suddenly I'm realizing like we need to close this gap and we need to be able to help people actually launch their online courses. So we start offering these launch consulting services and for the next two years is basically going back to the customer research that we should have done much, much earlier. And closing the gap meant building, for us, building a coaching program, which I'll get into a little bit more. Run Your Learning Launch is basically a course to help people launch the very first version of their online course, a beta, a learning launch. So I ran it in alpha and beta. And so this is really the beginning of integrating the different parts of our business and realizing poor Ben couldn't build and sell Doki on his own. I was gonna have to help with that process. We were gonna have to integrate the different parts of our businesses. And then some other things were happening around the same time. Bought a house, bought a car, got married, some next level adulting going on. So this was <laughs> the beginning of bringing different parts of our lives together as well and asking ourselves, what kind of life do we want for ourselves? How can we make this sustainable? How can we make sure we're not working like crazy people so integrating rather than segregating is an important permaculture principle. So a great example of this is say an herb spiral garden. So you're, you're picking the herbs, you're using them in the kitchen, uh, you're using the compost to feed the herb spiral. So everything's kind of working together, which builds resilience, you're doing function stacking, it's all about creating less work for yourself. So on the SaaS side, like what do we each want to get out of the business? even in terms of how many hours we're spending doing things. Um, how can we collaborate and make better use of our skill set? I'm on the front end, I'm working with people, Ben's on the back end working with the tech. Why are we not working together in a better way to grow this thing together? How can we make things easier? So a reality check is, it's way easier for us to sell a $2,000 a month coaching retainer than a $49 a month subscription. It's way easier to sell a $1,000 coaching program than a $49 a month SaaS subscription. You might recognize this, uh, <laughs> this slide from Adam's talk. I swear I already had this in my talk when he had this. But even, even Brendan Dunn sort of experienced a similar thing, um, you know, similarly breaking some rules about starting over with a new audience, right? Um, it can be a lot easier to make courses than to sell subscriptions. How do we work with that? So I was going through a bit of my own existential crisis because all of our revenue is coming in from something that is not necessarily related to our product. So I hired an instructional designer and I got her to take a look at my course, kind of rip it to shreds, log, log in, even talk to students. She actually interviewed students who had taken my program to get feedback from them. Went deeper on the customer research. Now my plan initially was to put Digital Strategy School on hold and kind of turn it into an evergreen product because it was a coaching program. So I mentioned that we did this uh, course consulting and we really started to shift our company's positioning toward being the people that help you launch your courses. This is around the time that Ben asked me this question. Um, he asked, he's asked me this question more than once. I really don't hate making money. I loved working on Digital Strategy School. I loved, um, it was probably some of the easiest and most fun revenue that I was able to bring in, but I knew that something had to give and the effort it was gonna to take to make that ready to go evergreen was too much. I knew we needed to, to build a bridge between our, our new services and product. And so we went back to what we knew how to do best, which is working with clients one-on-one. -on -one. This is where we shine. We know how to close the sale when we get on a call with someone. So some of the things that we noticed, people were spending way too long building their courses and programs before validating an idea similar to what we had done with Doki. <laughs> People were signing up for the platform long before they actually had their content created, and they would procrastinate on it. Amateur course creators were fire-hosing people with way too much information. And people were also expecting that they were gonna build an online course and it was just gonna replace their revenue overnight. And so this led to a new coaching program, Run Your Learning Launch, don't procrastinate and get stuck for months and years. I'd seen people procrastinate for years fire hose their learners with information, uh, don't assume that more content equals more value. These were all things that we had noticed working one-on-one -on -one with people. 
So now we had this little ecosystem. We've got consulting, we've got coaching, we've got online courses, we've got custom projects. We're still doing some web design clients at the same time. So Run Your Learning Launch ended up leading people into our platform because it teaches you how to get your course ready. Now we have a platform for that. Still doing custom web projects, course consulting. And so our demos of Doki have actually now been leading to coaching and consulting projects. So it's been a lead generation tool for us. We finally, finally had an integrated product service SaaS ecosystem. All the revenue wasn't coming from where we expected it to come from. Right? We put all this pressure on our SaaS to pull in that income, but the truth is we're a services-based company that built a product that took on a life of its own, but really our strength is in the services. So on-demand demos have become a lead generation tool for our services. That's a thing we didn't expect to have happen. So integration rather than segregation is a really important principle. All of the elements should work collectively toward a stronger whole. Where could we overlap our, the energy that we're putting into things? I knew for us that needed to be reducing the number of services that we were offering that were outside of the product ecosystem. Leverage your existing skills and assets. Again, for us, we know how to sell to a tiny group of people, right? Selling a $50,000 program before we had 500 people on our list. Um, email is just a tool for connection, but we had different ways of connecting with people. Facebook groups, forums, uh, Instagram, Twitter, etc. So how might you integrate services into your SaaS? You know, it doesn't work for everyone. I know some of you have mentioned, like, I don't want to do consulting, and that's totally fine. But for us, that's where we shine. And it's also, in a way, you're getting paid to do that customer development. So the next phase is about creatively using and responding to change. In permaculture, we say, you don't have an aphid problem, you have a ladybug deficiency. It's the idea that the problem is the solution. So we had to adapt in a way that made sense for the way we already work with people, right? We knew that we didn't want to be the build your six-figure passive income course people. There's plenty of other people out there making that promise. Like, we don't really want to do that. The so two years of working with course creators and coaches finally gave us those insights that we were looking for. We finally stopped worrying about what our competitors were doing and focused on what our customers needed. We adapted the copy that we, we learned from people in the coaching program and in our consulting, and we doubled down on, go beyond courses. There's so much you can do beyond courses. Training programs, masterminds. Because we were dealing with a coaching audience, we needed to use slightly different language with them and integrated this into our pages. I'm not sure if you guys can, can see this, but evergreen courses, dripped courses, resource libraries, mentorship programs, training hubs, we started using different language than just say, build your online course. We're gonna attract a different audience, a more high touch audience. So we had to adapt our language and our features to our best customers. And really this was kind of our scrappy advantage. Like we knew how to use the language to create that resonance with people because we knew we couldn't compete on features. Anyone who went to growth, like we are not teachable. We are not gonna be pulling in 10 million MRR. And that's not, that's not us, that's not what we want. That's not sustainable for us. So everything became easier when we kind of let go of what we thought we needed to be and just focused on the customers that we knew we could serve really well. So better copy creates that resonance which can help you stay competitive. So even if you have feature parity with someone else, the right copy resonating with the right people can make a huge, huge difference. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Change is inevitable. Um, competitors are inevitable. How are you going to deal with that? It can be uh, slightly demotivating when every week you see a new competitor that's doing something similar. You're gonna have to find your differentiator. You know, there's always gonna be new competitors. So these are the permaculture principles. Observe and interact. Use small and slow solutions. Design from patterns to details. Integrate rather than segregate. Creatively use and respond to change, which translates to these. Make sure that you are deeply understanding the people and the problem first. Favor small progress and share iterations first. Design for generalities before specifics. Think of everything as a functioning whole and embrace change and adapt. So it took us three years to find our groove and finally become sustainable. Is your SaaS part of your business or is it your whole business? 
I think we had sort of expected almost overnight we were going to build a product and you know, it was going to replace our full-time income. And for us, that hasn't been the case. Our SaaS brings in the equivalent of an underpaid employee. And it's wonderful. It pays our mortgage. It pays our car. It's on autopilot. Even if we don't work on it for a month, it brings in that recurring revenue. Not a full-time revenue, but that's okay for us. That works for us. We're happy being small. So why would we hustle so damn hard for a life that we already have? We've got great clients. We've got a functioning SaaS. We've got hobbies. I can play in the garden. We've got all of these things. So once we let go of the shoulds and the FOMO and you know, we need to keep up with these competitors and we kind of let it go, we realize that we can make a great living as a small company and still love our life. So what do you want to get out of your SaaS? And how hard are you willing to work for it? There's no right answer, but I think it's really important to take a step back and ask yourself, what are you building and why? What do you want to get out of it? We've made a conscious choice to grow slowly with less stress and less FOMO. Yes, sometimes we are the bottleneck in our business. Absolutely, we're not going to grow as fast as some other companies might be happy with, but it works for us. We're okay with the nice trickle of growth. That's a decision that we've made. Thank you. <laughs> Don't hesitate to say hello. Um, if you want any more resources here too, if you're curious about permaculture, check out Gaia's Garden. Um, our program, Run Your Learning Launch, is at uh, learn.weareoki.com slash launch. There is a free course there too. If you are thinking of creating your own course and just want to get it out rough and ready, you can sign up there. Um, should have put Mochi's Instagram account on there because she's pretty cute. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Awesome. Uh, who has a question for Marie? Anyone have a question? We have time for some questions if anyone does. Any questions? About, oh, right over here. Did anyone else notice my shirt's inside out? <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> you didn't see so, anything. So the question I've got is related to you and Ben. Yeah. Is um, running a business, can I assume you're married to, to each other? Just got married in August, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> So, obviously, here we hear a lot about you know co-founders and uh -huh. problems, and now we're getting to a married couple What's being like co-founders. Yeah. Um, have you set? I ask this because I'm sort of helping my wife do some stuff as well. Yeah. Have you set ground rules with like powers of veto if necessary, or <laughs> you know the just in case scenarios? Mm. I think um, what works for us is being very very clear about what our different strengths and responsibilities are. Um, and being really honest about that, like knowing where your limitations are and kind of, um, I think with, let's say product features or things like that, if there's something that we're not seeing eye to eye on, and like that does happen. There are times where I'm like, no, actually, I don't think that's the right direction to go. And, you know, we can disagree on that. Sometimes I'll say, let's take it to our mastermind group, right? Let's run it by some other people and make sure that we're not being too insular with the way we're making that decision. Um, so I think what works is we treat each other like equals and we give each other a ton of autonomy, which can sometimes prove other other challenges like we've found that we have to have a meeting every week to get on the same page because otherwise we kind of trust that we're each you got this I got this we're go kind of going off in different directions and we're like wait what we need to get back on the same page so that's been something that's really important the weekly meetings and weekly check-ins being honest about your strengths and your limitations and if you're if you're really kind of not on the same page about something just getting a an outside perspective Hi, Marie. Thank you for the talk and oh, back here. What? This, yes. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that uh, copy um, and having the right copy can create resonance um, and using your customers' words in order to do that. But are there any other ways that you use to know if you're creating resonance with um, new copy or to be able to find out if you are creating resonance uh, when even if you're using customer Get your, uh, get your friends and your customers to describe what you do. That's an interesting one. When someone, one of your friends tries to introduce you to someone else, oh yeah, Marie and Ben, they do the like, whatever the heck, like what words are they using? That's always kind of an interesting one. Like how do outside people perceive you? Um, yeah, like running it by friends, running it by other people in the industry. Uh, we do a lot of masterminders with, with other um, software people and I think it's just really good to make sure you're getting out of your head and, and testing it. And, 
if you're really close, I mean, we are close with our customers. We know a lot of them personally. They're in communities that we're in. So um, sometimes someone will just, hey, I love that change that you made, or like, you know, those questions that they're asking. So we try to be in touch with people as much as possible to, to really be listening for that, to see if that resonance is there. And honestly, experimentation, always tweaking it and testing it and just seeing what, what works. So I'm not sure if that, that answers, but. All right, we have another question middle and back here. Hi, Marie, uh, Hi. thanks for the talk. Um, I was curious, uh, when you first launched the platform and then as your uh, ecosystem, as you put it, sort of evolved to include more services, um, how did the competitive landscape factor into your decision making there? So mm. um, the e-learning uh, yeah. industry seems to have lots of different options in it. Um, yeah. I'm not sure how old that is. Maybe you guys were one of the early players in the scenes, but how did that influence your decisions? Did that push you towards services, towards a platform? How did that work? Yeah, I mean, and honestly, that insight also came from a mastermind group where um, people said, well, it sounds like you guys are so high touch. Like, why fight it? Like, maybe you should actually even adjust your your SaaS sign-up page to like, it actually includes a one-hour call. Like, why don't you double down on that? If that's something that's, that already is working for you, why not do that? Um, so in a way, we, we kind of had to lean on the, that's our strategic advantage is that we were personable. Like, you know, I've said to some of you in, in the calls, like, I love making friends with strangers on the internet. I love talking to people. I make time for virtual coffee dates. I'm always doing that stuff. And, and that's our strength. And so I'm not the person that's going to be driving SEO traffic and, and doing all these tactics. I'm, I'm the people person. And so um, let's use that to our advantage. And we, you know, we had someone who had used a competitor and then did a demo with us. And they said, you know what? I, it doesn't bother me that you're just a two-person team. I actually like that I'm talking to a human right now because the other guys used a bot and they tricked me. I thought they were a real human. And so they really liked that we were, they were able to speak with us directly. And it's maybe not scalable you know, at a huge scale, but also we don't need that many customers to be profitable. So it's just kind of leaning on the stuff that you, that you know already works. Okay, we'll do one more question over on your right over here. Great talk, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the uh, I'm into permaculture, uh, yeah. it's very interesting, and so this is a great thing. Thank you for connecting those dots in awesome. my brain. Yeah. It's now a new concept that I'm going to try and use as a framework. Love that. Um, but we, we were at the round table yesterday, and I think it was very interesting, and I might be beneficial for the audience here to describe your varied audience and your customer base that is not technical, and like what like walks of life and the people that are out there to expose to generally a technical audience, what type of customers are out there looking for solutions? Oh, like, um, I mean, my audience is 98% women entrepreneurs. And I was just kind of encouraging people that I think it's really easy to get stuck in your bubble, right? Especially if kind of the majority of the audience is building products for other developers. But my gosh, there are so many other very valuable markets and even, um, Patrick talked about this too, like who are the underserved markets and who are the people that have money? Women are very, very willing to spend money on their business. Like I'm always buying, like really getting into the core space, it was kind of as a course taker, like whether you call that imposter complex or whatever, like not good enough, I gotta take all the courses and learn all the things. So women are very willing to pay for help and to get involved in communities. So just be mindful that there are so many bubbles that you know, we are not aware of and you gotta step out of your own, your own little bubble to, to expose yourself to just other people who are doing interesting things, right? Nice to see a few more ladies at <laughs> MicroConf this year. Yay, ladies! <laughs> uh, Great, yeah. thanks so much, Marie. Cool.